Do you need a program to show medical or dental schools that you can handle the demands of their program because your undergraduate record just doesn't quite do it? Well, pull up a chair. Our guest today is a director of the Tufts Master's in Biomedical Sciences program, which has an 80% plus admit rate to medical school and a 99% admit rate to dental school. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 535th episode of Mission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me. If you're considering a post-bac or special master's program, download the A to Z of Applying to Post-bac Programs, which teaches you how to apply effectively to post-bac programs. It covers choosing the programs, writing strong personal statements, securing effective letters of recommendation, and much more. Grab your copy at accept.com slash pb. Our guest today is Dr. James Cabellis, Assistant Professor of Medical Education at Tufts University and Associate Director of the MBS program. Dr. Cabellis earned his bachelor's degree at University of Vermont and his PhD at Tufts, and his PhD is in cell, molecular, and developmental biology. Dr. Cabellis, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. All right, great. Now let's start with the basics. Can you give an overview of the Tufts MS in Biomedical Sciences program? Absolutely. So our MS in Biomedical Sciences program here at Tufts or MBS program uh, started in 2007, and it is a special master's program. It's designed to give students an opportunity to demonstrate that they can excel at a really rigorous science curriculum. So we base that curriculum off the first year of our medical school's curriculum. Our program's housed here down at the medical center, the Boston campus of Tufts University. So Tufts has a few campuses spread out around Massachusetts. The main undergrad campus is in Medford, Mass., which is about you know six miles up the road from downtown Boston, where we are. And they also have the uh, Grafton campus, which houses the vet school. So we're right here on the medical campus with the medical school, the dental school, uh, the PA program is right down the hall from me. And we're also right by Tufts Medical Center. So we share a lot of faculty. All our faculty that teach in the MBS program are also course directors and faculty within the medical school and the dental school, like myself. Um, I teach in anatomy and neuroscience and across a bunch of the different programs. And we're really trying to model that rigorous curriculum um, so that students can come into our program and demonstrate to schools that, okay, maybe undergrad didn't go quite right, but now I've made whatever changes I need and now I can really handle that and excel. And what we've seen from our students is, you know, whether they've come here to Tufts, um, matriculate on here for the medical dental or gone other places that they've been really well prepared, not just, you know, content wise. Yeah, good. But also just being able to handle the volume, um, the high pace that, you know, most medical and dental schools go with their curriculums. Right. That, that sounds wonderful. How long is the program? Is it one year or two years? It's either one year or two year. Most students are going to take a little bit over a year. So the didactic portion, the coursework, we have two semesters fall semester and spring semester and spring semester ends around May-ish, early May. Then there's a thesis component. And in theory, that thesis component can be completed over the summer. So it's possible to get the program finished in one year. A lot of the dental students do that because they're often matriculating onto dental school directly from MBS. But most of the medical students are going to probably try and get it done in a year, but it will often end up pushing it out maybe into the fall semester or even to the spring semester and making it a two-year program just because they're focused on, you know, getting in their medical school applications and going through that process. And, you know, they should be prioritizing that over the thesis, I think, you know, just because that is such a rigorous process. Oh, yeah. It's they're, they're quite demanding. So if you're enrolled in the MBS program, you have the one-year didactic portion, then you would apply to, let's say, medical school. And then you do the research component or finish off whatever needs to be finished off for, for to get the master's, correct? Do I, do I understand you Yeah, correctly? that's that's the typical, typical. Um, timeline. There are some students that, you know, will have applied before MBS and then mm-hmm. will occasionally, it's like usually a handful 
out of you know the somewhere the, like the 70 to 120 students we, in the, we have in the program for medicals for md students usually a handful of them will be gain acceptance during the year usually not to tufts tufts likes to see you complete the entire yeah, didactic portion so. before giving the acceptance but to other schools then there's also some students that might decide they want to wait a whole nother year before applying so sure. it depends on where they're at and sort of like how what they've accomplished before they came to MBS. Now you mentioned that dental students tend tend to be more likely to finish it off. So they have a slightly different calculus. Mm -hmm. And about what percentage of the class is pre-med as opposed to pre-dental? So usually it's about 10% um, pre-dental. Pre so usually somewhere in the eight to 12 student ballpark. And we have some specific courses, some elective courses that are like intro to dentistry one, intro to dentistry two, that are specifically designed for those dental students. And they also have, you know, advising that comes straight from the dental school itself. And you, most of the time, those students have applied to dental school already and are sort of in that process. And like, we help them with that process. So like sending an update letter, usually they're here at Tufts MBS because they want to go to Tufts Dental School. And right. so we work well. I mean, I meet with their dean of admissions pretty regularly. And, you know, we'll send after, you know, fall, co fall courses are over, we send in an update letter, let them know how they're doing as they're, you know, working through their admissions process. Right. The program is geared for people whose undergraduate record doesn't convince medical schools they're ready for medical school. So yep. is remediation a part of the, the program, filling in gaps perhaps in their undergraduate education, or is it really more like first year medical school? Or is there a combination? I mean... Yeah, so it's really, I would say it's more like first year medical school in that the bulk of the coursework, except for a couple, like a, a couple credits of electives, it's prescribed. Like you are taking this set of courses in the fall, this set of courses in the spring. It's, you know, foundational stuff. So biochemistry, cell biology, immunology, microbiology, all the foundational courses that medical school, dental schools want to see, physiology, anatomy. So if maybe they've taken those in the past, I mean, biochemistry is all, always a big one. One of the things that, one of the ones that we usually see that, you know, people probably struggled with um, a little bit in undergrad. And so that's one of our biggest courses in the fall, um, one that takes up a lot of time. And so there's some remediation, I think, that's happening there because yeah. you can demonstrate like, okay, I've got my, I got a, <laughs> the second pass through biochemistry. Okay. It's went a lot better this time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> some review. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. What is the application process like for the master's in biomedical sciences? Okay, so our application process, it opens up in October and it will run through July 15th, which is coming up, though sometimes we do extend it up to maybe August 1st, you know, we typically don't fill our class. We're not just trying to fill seats. We want to, you know, bring in students yeah. that we are actually going to help. And so typically we aren't going to fill our seats. I think a full class would be around 130 um, we generally don't have that many, but the process starts in, in October and we have a couple priority deadlines where, you know, if you get your application into us by, I think it's November 21st or something like that, we'll get an, a response a decision from the admissions committee back within a month. And then we have another priority deadline in, I believe, the end of January, where same turnaround a month. And then from there, it's sort of rolling admissions. Got it. And then, you know, it's kind of typical, like we don't do interviews. Um, as part of our admissions process, but we are taking the admissions committee um, is taking a holistic review of an applicant. So all the strengths and weaknesses we're trying to see. And the admissions committee, its makeup is seven faculty, five of which are, are also on the MD admissions uh, committee. Um, actually, our, the chair of our admissions committee is the longest standing member of the MD admissions committee right now. So that's our, that's actually the chair of our department, Dr. Peter Broder. Got it. Okay. That, that sounds good. Now I noticed that you accept the MCAT, the DDT and the GRE. Is there any mm -hmm. preference among those tests? We prefer like the MCAT and the DAT. Um, I'm sorry, DAT, not DDT. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Um, <laughs> we prefer those, but at the same time, those are big high stakes exams that will stay on a student's record, as you know, and schools will be able to see them. And one of our recommendations is like, don't take that test until you're really ready. Don't just right. take it because oh, I want to go to MBS. So I got to like do this test now. 
that's not going to be good. And that's going to stick with you, you know? Um, yeah. So we do accept practice exams um, mm. for both of those. Maybe they won't carry as much weight, but they also don't have, you know, that that same potential for, for damaging your application in the future. At the same time, though, students shouldn't take those practice exams as well, you know, just to take them together. They, they, there's, there's some prep, you should do some prep because if it's, you know, you're sending like a 482 like practice MCAT, it's yeah, like, what happened here? But if that does happen, <laughs> one of the things that our missions could be always wishes we, that we could like talk to students and tell them this is like, if something ever on your application, like, isn't like quite what you wish it was, at, or, and that there's a good reason, like, tell us, like, the last thing you want an admissions committee to do is like, trying to make up a story about something. Mm -hmm. It's like, maybe if they don't, maybe if I don't talk about this, th this blemish <laughs> on my, my application, they won't notice it. <laughs> We're going to see everything. And like, you know, the more you can do to explain things, the better, the more that's going to help us make a, make an accurate decision about your application. Right. Context. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Context counts. Sure does. But what kind of academic stats would cause you to be really concerned about a student's ability to succeed in your program, whether it's a test score or the GPA? And then what should students do if their stats are below those numbers and they're interested in building a case for acceptance? Yeah, I mean, usually... usually... I mean, obviously, on one hand, the program is for people that can't quite cut it for medical school, but there has to be a point where it's like, mm, I don't know. What's yeah, and I mean, and we a lot of people are coming for different reasons, and like you know, a lot of people have stuff happen to them during undergrad where like sure. you know, like classes, like whatever they they you wanted to prioritize, and you had this dream, or maybe you came to the dream a little bit later, but you couldn't prioritize things like you wanted to, and so you know, oftentimes we see like the science suffering. We don't have like a fixed like GPA that we're like screening out, but I mean, usually sort of our sweet spot for where we see people GPAs come in and be successful is like in that 3.0 to like 3.4, 3.5 range. Those are usually the students we like to see feel like we can help them. But it's not usually just one thing. It's usually a like, it's a holistic thing. So like, yeah, you could have a GPA that's below that, maybe a 2.7, 2.8. But if you're also coming in like a, a, a nice MCAT, you know, in the like 505, 506, 507, that says like, okay, like, yeah, they didn't do well in biochemistry. They didn't do well in molecular biology, you know, their junior year. We can see that. But clearly we see the breakdown of their scores on the MCAT and like their bio, their bio section, you know, that was good. That was a 128. So clearly they can, they've got this and they can do it. Um, so we're trying to take a holistic review and try and like, okay, see where the things are that we can help and see if we can do something to help them. Is grade trend a factor also? Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, if there's definitely, if there's an upward trajectory, we love to see that. And then another thing that we sometimes see is students that have been out of school for a while, or even if they were on a downward trend, sometimes something that can help is like, all right, you've been out of school for a while, you've been working, um, you know, your GPA in undergrad wasn't super good. Maybe take like a course here or there through like a Harvard extension or a Berkeley extension, a, a science Community course. college, would that help? Sure, that would work and crush it, ace it. Mm -hmm. um, just, to, just to demonstrate, okay, I'm still, I still have some academic chops, like, you know, do some I of can those. Do it. I, I can do that. I'm still really interested. And so that, you know, demonstrates the admissions committee of like, okay, this person, it has like, you know, maybe turn that corner and it has that focus where they're going to come in and be ready to be successful because our, our curriculum is very fast paced and there's the whole you know drinking from the fire fire hydrant analogy that always gets thrown around and it really is kind of like that so <laughs> right right and what kind of experience do you like to see in your applicants clinical research and or service to underserved and those are all important to medical school what about sure the mbs are. program they are um and you know we'd like to see them as well i mean ideally a student is coming into mbs program having good clinical research, you know, just having some research, having some good clinical experiences, maybe has done some shadowing, has done some patient facing, you know, work, has demonstrated a commitment to, the, to their community through some volunteering and has that already. It's just like the GPA thing from undergrad um, that we can help, but that's not always the case. Um, right. And medical schools, dental schools, 
you know, it seems like more and more they want applications are looking for this more and more, you yeah. know, where like, you know, most students now, I think, in going to medical school, the number, the percentage of students that are going straight out of college is decreasing. The numbers of students that are taking one, two gap years is increasing oh, just yeah. because they're trying to fill in those other things. Because most schools are doing that holistic review where it's not just undergrad performance. It's not just an MCAT. It's like, okay, what are, what are these other things that you're doing that, you know, are hopefully going to, you know, fit with the mission of the school, you know, whether it's like social justice or whether it's volunteerism or whether it's, you know, a dedication to like urban medicine or rural medicine, all those things you want to be trying to demonstrate. So if a student can come into MBS with those and can focus on, you know, doing the academics here, mm -hmm. doing the coursework, great. If not, um, those are sometimes the students that end up, you know, okay, doing MBS and then not applying directly after that, but taking another year to then, okay. And like, that's the advice and we try and give them is to like, okay, sort of assess where, where you're at. Um, cause like and same advisors that are, you know, on the admissions committee and are on the MD admissions committee are also advisors in our program. So they're, when you, students in our, in our program here are getting, a, they're getting a lot of advice from like actual admissions people. So it's, that tends to help them. <laughs> That's great. And um, helps a lot. I'm sure. Yeah. What happens to an, an application to the MBS program once it's submitted? So once it's submitted, it's going to come in to Jess Ronan, who is our admissions uh, coordinator, who is amazing. Um, and we're hoping she gets some more help soon because she's <laughs> doing us and she's doing the PA program. I mean, she's just fantastic. Um, she'll come in and she works a lot with students to help like make sure transcripts are in order, letters have come in, helps like help will help applicants put their application together. Once it's set, it will go into... It will go to our chair of the admissions committee, uh, Dr. Broder. He will then distribute it out to a couple of the people on the admissions committee who will then read the whole entire app and take a look at it, come up with some determination, and it'll go to the then it'll go to the full committee um, to review and discuss. Okay, great. I noticed that the site, the website for the MBS program emphasizes the collaborative nature of, of the program. Mm -hmm. How is that non-competitiveness encouraged by notoriously competitive, among notoriously competitive pre-meds? And how is it manifested by the students in the program? Yeah, a lot of them, when they, they hear about that, and when they come here, they don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> like, a little yeah, skepticism I mean, there, maybe? I mean, yeah, because they're, you know, they're going to be, most of them are coming here to Tufts. And like Tufts probably isn't going to accept all of them. They haven't yet. Maybe it'll happen one day, but they haven't, they don't usually accept all the students. And so like, you know, you, you, I mean, I can imagine that, yeah, you're going to feel like you are competing for a limited number of spots, um, even though they don't have a set set quota over across the street. But what we try and do to minimize that that competitiveness is we don't keep a class rank. So when we're writing our committee letters, we aren't ranking students against the other students in the MBS program. What we're actually doing is we are ranking them against their performance to the medical school students that are, since we are mirroring that curriculum, they are taking exams that are very, very close. I'm not allowed to say they're exactly the same, but they're very close because <laughs> the way we do our exam banks, but they're very close. And so we can, we can track their performance compared to the MD class. It helps that the MD program is pass fail. So they're maybe not trying to get that A as much as mm -hmm. our MBS students, which, you know, works out to their benefits. But then we do like my talk to statisticians and we do like a Z score and there's a whole thing. And so we rank them based to, compared to those MD students. So that helps. So in theory, like all the end, we're not grading on a curve. So everything's a straight grade. So if you get an A and the next person next to you gets an A and the other person gets an A, you're all getting A's. Right. So that works. It works out really well. And it, it's helpful now with the, with the linkage um, that we have with the medical school and in their interviews. Right. And, and that's actually my next question. There is this very prominent linkage to Tufts Medical School. How does that work? And is there a linkage to the dental school also? Okay. So um, I'll come back to that second one because that's yeah. okay. Different, so, right. say not yet. Okay. <laughs> it's a work in progress. But the the linkage, the interview linkage with the medical school, it's now, you know, heavily promoted on the website and everything. So 510 on the MCAT, uh, 3.7 GPA in the program. 
it's honestly something that the medical school had sort of always been sort of around that area, but just hadn't put the numbers down. And so they decided, you know, okay, let's, let's do this. It's what we're doing. And just to give some clarity um, and transparency to the MBS program and the students in it to like, this is what we're looking for. And if you are able to do that in the program, you're going to get a guaranteed interview. One of the advising things that we you know, do, because we do have students coming in with different levels of like, in addition to like the academics and the MCAT score, you know, different levels of shadowing, different levels of volunteering. Medical school still wants to see all that. It's a holistic sure. review. And so the last thing we want we want to happen is someone's like guaranteed interview to turn into a guaranteed rejection because they don't have any clinical experience. Because we know the medical school wants to see that because they want their students to do well in like the preclinical years of medical school. But after that, they're going into the clinic, they're doing their rotations and they got to prepare, be prepared for that and know what they're getting into. Because that's exactly. a whole, like, that is the meat and potatoes of medical school is, is the clinical stuff. So we, we try to prepare them for that. With the dental school, I mean, we've been at, as I mentioned earlier, been talking a lot with, with their dean of admissions. We do get students, sometimes they'll, their admissions will send students over to us with sort of a, a conditional deferred acceptance, telling them, you know, you do this and, and we'll you know, give you an interview and then accept you. But we're trying to formalize that now. We don't have anything, you know, definitive to put on paper but it's being discussed. But I will say that like typically our MBS students that like complete the program, the number of them that get into dental school, whether it's Tufts or other places, NYU accepts a bunch of ours, New England Dental accepts a bunch of our students. The success rate is in the upper nineties for those students. Right. So we do pretty well there. That's for sure. Yeah. Now we've you know, touched on the importance of clinical exposure and, and the preference to have it before they get to, to the MBS program. But do you also help students obtain clinical exposure while at Tufts? Or do you prefer that they focus on the academics while in the program and then get the clinical community service, et cetera, before or in the second year of the program, if they do that? Yeah, ideally, if they have it done beforehand, that is great. Um, and then maybe they continue it a little bit, but we always, we always see students come in at orientation. They are very gung ho. We're, they're going to like do the academics and they're going to start volunteering and then they're going to do some shadowing and get some clinical work and they're going to do everything. We're like, hold on, <laughs> you're here first and foremost to do, to do the academics. So then we try and like, we try and limit how much extra they're trying to do. We tell them, you know, if you're doing volunteer work, like or like anything else, like try and keep it to like maybe like eight to 10 hours a week. That's still the gang. Just, significant. It's still significant. And we know we can't really stop them. You know, they're going to still do a lot of work, but we want them really to focus. And like, until like we get through the first exam or two to know what, no, you know, this is what I got to be doing. This is, this is where I'm at. And this is how I'm doing um, to focus on that so that, you know, they're not going to waste like, cause the, GPA here is going to be the most important thing because that's, you know, what we feel they're doing the program for. Then once that, you know, has gotten going, we start introducing some of the other things. So volunteering, we have a Tufts Cares program where we partner with a lot of sites, hospice, Meals on Wheels, Family Van, different things around the community to increase that community involvement. And for clinical exposure, I mean, there's lots of, there, we're attached to the medical center. So it often happens as students will, you know, meet professors or meet with clinicians that are teaching some of our courses and will, you know, ask if they can shadow um, or find shadows, shadowing through that and going directly to them. We're also piloting a program, hopefully it's off the ground this fall, where the hospital has per diem work that they need to get done all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have a population of students that wants to be in the hospital doing stuff all the time as well. And so we are we are establishing a sort of partnership where we're hoping that our students can help fulfill that role at the hospital. And you know, it's going to benefit the hospital, it's going to benefit patients, and it's also going to benefit our students. Great. Sounds yeah. good. How do students do if they want to go to medical school or dental school, but not necessarily to Tufts or Tufts doesn't accept them? How do they do in the application process? Um, students have done reasonably well, I think. Um, typically, like Tufts is going to accept somewhere between like 25 to 35 MBS students per year. Um, usually it's closer to 30 to 35. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that group, we'll have 
you know, like maybe 25 to 30 that will actually go to Tufts. And then the other ones will go somewhere else off into their state schools. But then some also won't get into Tufts. The interview definitely, definitely counts um, when you're interviewing at Tufts. It's not a guaranteed thing. Right. Um, but they do pretty well at other schools. So definitely what students do well with their state schools, which is great because usually the tuition is a lot money. less, sure. which is fantastic. And then we have, I mean, I don't want to say like specific names of schools because then like, <laughs> but we have schools that, you know, our students have done that like, that seem to like our students. Okay. Um, yeah. And we heard a little bit from our, from, from their admissions, their admissions deans that like, yeah, they like, they like our students because they come in prepared and they're ready to go. Um, they know that like, we're going to, they're going to have a, a, a student that's going to be able to excel academically. But the other aspect is the, they're going to be professional. Um, while they're there so they're going to be filling out their evaluations and they're going to be showing up to class and all those other things because like the medical school we try and do that too <laughs> right right now I'm sure there are some graduates of the MBS program who ultimately decide not to pursue a career as a physician or dentist mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the advantages of a special master's program is that you end up with a degree what do they what does that group and what's what is the size of that group approximately in percentage terms and what do they do after they graduate yeah, I would say that percentage is probably somewhere in the 10 to 20% range. Um, it varies per year. I mean, I actually have one of my advisees a few years ago. She got into medical school, got into Albany, and then decided she didn't want to go and instead went to did her doctorate of physical therapy. So still in the health profession, but decided, you know what, after doing it and after going through the whole process, decided, okay, this is not what's this is not the lifestyle. This is not what I want to do. And went off and did did, did a DPT and thought now I was really happy and that's doing great. really well. So I mean, like that's the thing. It's like, all right, you came to MBS and like, you know, not exactly what we're, our focus is. Our focus is getting people into medical and dental school. Um, but if you come here and you figure out that like, you know, this is what I want to do and this is what's going to be happy, like the MBS degree still help can help you do that. Right. So um, we have students that you know go off to other careers. Sometimes it's PA, um, which again, not that much different. But then we also have students that go and work in industry, whether it's pharmaceutical industry, because, you know, they've taken the first year of medical school courses. So and they've got their master's degree and so they they're really well, like the foundational science of medical school. We also have some students that, you know, decide that they're more interested in the public health aspect mm -hmm. of medicine while they're here. And so for them, we have a dual degree. Um, program, which students can either apply to before coming to MBS or while they're in the program. Um, what's nice about that is they get to utilize a couple of the courses that they take for MBS, also for their MPH degree. So they'll do that and then go off on the public health route. And then I mentioned the industry. And then we also have a few, we have some students come on, they're doing really well that have gone into sort of medical devices yeah. industry and sort of like, you know, working on that and like they're now they're you know in the operating room like with the surgeons and like demoing things and like yeah i'm thinking of one student in particular that's really loving her job right now yeah that's great that's great yeah. so there's multiple opportunities there obviously even if your focus is on one thing there's there's still multiple opportunities yep. now the application deadline, probably by the time the show airs, will will have passed. I didn't realize it hasn't passed yet. What advice would you give to applicants interested in applying to matriculate in fall 2024? Maybe they're applying now to medical school, but not terribly optimistic about their likelihood of their acceptance. Maybe they're just they're, they're going to graduate in in June and they see that their GPA is not what it needs to be. What advice would you give? So my advice to them would be to you know. Keep doing all the things that are going to make you a stronger medical school applicant because it's going to make you a stronger MBS applicant. So one of the things is like, okay, as you're going through and putting together your, your medical school or dental school application, where were the weakness? Where are the weaknesses? Where are the things that you struggle to write about? Um, and focus on sort of addressing those, whether it was shadowing, clinical exposure, whether it was volunteering, try and address those. If you've been out of school for a while, Again, go and maybe take a take a community college course. Um, demonstrate that you know you still got some academic chops and you're still ready to do this. But we realize people also have to like often have to have to make make money, earn a living. So if you're doing that, you know you got to do that too. But like medical schools are always like medical schools want people that like to be busy because sure. medical school students are going to be busy, doctors are going to be busy. That has that's you got to like that lifestyle. 
And so that's what they want. That's what they're looking for. And so we're kind of looking for that too. Got it. Okay. Thank you. What would you have liked me to ask you? So one of the questions that we often get from our applicants is, you know, living in Boston, um, where do people live? And like we tell people usually like you want to live somewhere along public transportation. So nice subway, green line, red line, orange line, blue line somewhere. But, you know, it's expensive, but students usually live with with other students and, you know, they might not be MBS students. They might be students from, you know, a completely different program, maybe one of the arts programs or something. We have some of our MBS students that live with MAM students from, from the VU program. <laughs> so yeah, it's always interesting yeah. to see that interaction. And then another question that we often get about our program is scholarships and tuition aid. Just, we are expensive. I wish we weren't as expensive. I wish we were more, you, we can be more of a pathway program, um, especially for, you know, people from different socioeconomic standings that, you know, have had more roadblocks because we need more of those people in medicine. And so we have been increasing the number of scholarships that we have available. There's not all, as many of them as I'd like at this point, but that number is increasing, which I'm happy about, but they are there. It helps to apply early and it helps to ask about them as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just going to throw That's, that uh, That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Kevless, I think we're almost out of time. This has been just a lot delightful. Thank you so much for joining me today. Where can listeners learn more about the MS in Biomedical Sciences at Tufts University? Potential applicants or people that are interested want to go online and find us if they go to medicine.tufts.edu slash academics and slash special masters MBS. They will find us there, but we're going to be in that one of the drop downs on the main medical on the, the site for the medical school. They go under ed, academics, they'll find us. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going to include links in the show notes at accepted.com slash 535 to the MBS program, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Listener, thank you too for joining us for Admission Straight Talk's 535th episode. If you find the show worthwhile, please subscribe. Make sure you don't miss any future shows, be they with deans, admissions directors, professors, current students, test prep pros, or alumni doing great things. And final reminder, download your free copy of the A to Z of Applying to post Programs today at accept.com slash PB as in post back. Again, that's accept.com slash PB. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. <laughs>